Hey everyone, Sam Seiden here. Good to see everybody. Let's get started. Welcome to our trade of the week. So before we dive into that, <clears throat> the strategy that uh, we will talk about. Just a second. Let's get started. Okay, now we're ready to go. Sorry about that. So the strategy that uh, uh, that I always talk about, that we're going to talk about here and go over, is um, all about pure supply and demand. Um, I developed the strategy many years ago, working on the floor of the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and um, I'm going to share that with you here. Uh, by chance, I happened to be on the trading floor. Just as the transition from uh, floor paper, you know, order trading uh, was transitioning to electronic, uh, well, basically electronic everything, right, these days. So it was a fascinating experience. Um, the strategy uh, back then is exactly the same as the strategy back now. Nothing has changed. Um, I think the only thing that has uh, well, it hasn't changed, but what's happened during that time, and that was in the late 90s, what is, uh, you know, a lot of people have come along and there's, you know, different uh, different versions of the supply and demand strategy. And um, what I see for the most part is, you know, most people overcomplicate it. Uh, they add many things to it that hurt uh, and don't help. Um, and it's just one of those things where, there's really nothing to add to it. You know, if you think about it, uh, uh, I forgot, uh, there, you know, there's a scientific principle. There's a name for one where, uh, what is it again? The simplest answer is usually the right one. This is kind of one of those things. So uh, brought uh, a couple trading opportunities from our sessions this week. Um, we've got one that worked out really well, and we're going to go over one that didn't. And... The goal is by the end of the session that you understand why. So, and that's what we mean by pure supply and demand. Um, just just the, the, the strategy, again, that was originally developed. Um, that's what we focus on in our sessions. By the way, are there any members of, um, of our sessions with us here today? And, um, uh, and I'll, I'll know who I'm speaking to, who we're speaking to. Again, great to see everybody. Uh, yes, this is recorded. So also, uh, it is one rule-based strategy that we apply to day trading, swing trading, investing. Also, we equally apply it to any asset class, stocks, futures, forex, options, bonds, real estate, crypto, uh, you name it. Yes, all are welcome here. Great to see, uh, great to see everyone. And um, if, uh, yeah, if there's some, uh, some OTA people with us that maybe we haven't uh, been together in a couple months, uh, absolutely great to see you too. All right, let's get going. So before we dive in, we need to make sure that everybody understands that uh, nothing we're doing here is advice. Right. We all need to make decisions on our own. And uh, with that, we need to understand that everything, uh, everything we do in the trading and investing world has risk associated with it. And we talk about this all the time. In fact, in our sessions, we talk about these. Uh, we talk about risk all the time. And the most important thing is not just that you're OK with the risk. Of course, that's uh, critical. But before that, you have to make sure that you actually understand the risk they're taking on. And uh, once you do, make sure you're okay with it. Always, um, always think about uh, the worst case scenario in any action you take, and uh, and make sure you're okay with that. And if you are, uh, push the button. If you're not, don't. And of course, uh, uh, all copyright uh, laws and regulations apply here, also. So, you know, the reality is. Um, Let's talk about success for a minute. Um, I don't know. You tell me. I know nobody knows the actual answer to this 
uh, question. But what percentage of traders would you say are uh, fail? What's it, what percentage of traders would you say fail uh, out there in the world? And again, nobody knows the actual answer to that question. But uh, generally, what would you say? It's it's you know it's it's kind of well known that uh, many people that uh, actively trade or just trade period uh, don't do very well, right? And how many long term investors do you know that actually achieve their financial goals? Exactly. So ninety something percent of traders fail. Um, why in the world are you here? Why are we all here today? We must all be absolutely crazy to be here and talk about this. But we could be doing anything else in the world, but trying to do something that most people fail at. Well, um, being down on the trading floor and not being in the trading pit, not being allowed to trade my own account, but instead being on um, – uh, being on a trade desk right outside of the trading pits and facilitating order flow on the, for the professional side of the business and the retail side of the business, uh, side of the industry, I got to see at the transaction level, not what people's opinions or thoughts were, but where they actually put their when they actually put their money on the line, the action they took and where they took it at. And when you look at that, when you see that, it's crystal clear why most people, most novice active traders lose money and why um, professionals make so much, right? Why does the Wall Street professional make so much money and everybody else doesn't? Dennis Whitworth is with us here today. Great to see you, Dennis. All right, let's move forward. So we're going to keep coming back to that, that 90% or that 85%, whatever that is. I'm going to tie that back in in a minute. So um, this is a trade that played out, uh, trading opportunity that played out for our, uh, for us and our members um, throughout the week. This week, let's go over it and let's look at it. Uh, back on the twentieth uh, is when uh, we had our morning session. I was delivering that session along with Jasmine, and we set the trade up. So this was a buying opportunity. We identified uh, two demand zones sitting on top of each other here. I'll talk about those in a minute. And, uh, and price, you know, for you can see the dates for a couple weeks after that. Um, this was a swing trading opportunity. Okay. So uh, price over the next couple weeks traded around. And we were just waiting for it to possibly dip into our demand zone where we would have a low risk, high reward, and high probability buying opportunity. Okay. And, um, and we waited, right? So that was the setup. Now let's talk through this uh, before we before we you know dive too deep. The two things that we focus on, it's all about answering two questions: where will price turn and where will it go? To answer those questions, we look over here at our guide on the left, right? We understand that um, unfilled orders or supply or demand, right, cause prices to turn. In other words, like being on the trading floor, if I had a huge stack of buy orders right below current price, okay, and price came down to that level, the only way price is not going to turn there is if every one of those orders has to be filled before price goes through that level. So if price dropped a significant amount, and, I, and you see, I see out there in the trading pit or on the trading floor that there's not a lot of a lot of offers, a lot of supply, and we've got this huge stack of buy orders at a price level, odds are overwhelming that price is going to turn there. Okay. Now, again, I saw the order. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to be wrong. But again, that's why it was illegal for me to trade my own account. What I did was figure out what that picture looks like on a price chart. And that's what we're going over here today. And too many people just come at this and say, oh, there's supply, there's demand. Uh, I'm going to take that trade. You got to think a little bit deeper than that. Not more complex, just deeper. Trader009, great to see you. How you doing, buddy? I uh, haven't, haven't caught up in a while. Excellent. Hope all is well. All right. So 
when we say demand, we're talking about wholesale prices. When we talk about supply, we're talking about retail prices. What the professional trader and investor knows and thinks about that the novice trader doesn't is that how you make money buying and selling anything in life is exactly how you make money buying and selling in the financial markets. For some reason, everybody out there wants to talk about it like it's some fancy art with all these different strategies and everything else. Um, unfortunately, it's not. It's uh, how you make money buying and selling in the financial markets is exactly how you make money buying and selling anywhere else. So take a look. So we've got three areas in any market. Forget the chart for a minute. Three areas in any market. A price point where demand exceeds supply. And that demand means competition to buy. That competition to buy pushes price higher. We have a second place in a market, right, where price could be. And it could be supply, which is competition to sell. That competition to sell pushes price lower. In the middle, we have what we call the novice space. Why do we call it the novice space? Because professionals don't put on positions or big positions in the novice space. Only novice traders do. Okay. And we call this area relative balance. Why? Because a lot of people will call this equilibrium. Well, it's never equilibrium. It's never equal. Even if price stays in level for a period of time, it's always an unbalanced equation that takes time to play out. Right? So the picture of what these three areas look like on a price chart is very clear and always the same. And the nice thing is there's only two, two different, you know, pictures on a price chart. If you know what you're looking for, it's either an area of uh, where most orders are filled. In other words, there's a, um, a, a lack of a supply demand imbalance um, or areas where you have a lot of unfilled orders. And I want to talk about that just for a moment, and then most of this will, uh, I think, make sense. We also hear, like I'm telling you here, a lot of people talk about filled orders and unfilled orders, right? But this is not about a demand zone. It's just not – most people – I see a mistake people make is they just they, – they think about a demand zone, and they're just thinking about demand. They think about a supply zone, and they're just thinking about supply. That's not how this is done. That's not how prices turn in a market. That's not why prices move in a market. It's all about the imbalance. And try to really follow me here. It, at a demand zone, how out of balance is supply and demand? In other words, is there a thousand on the buy side and two on the sell side? That's a that's a big imbalance. Or are there a thousand on the buy side and nine hundred on the sell side? That's an imbalance. Price is going to go up in both equations, but the imbalance is not big. You certainly wouldn't want to take a trade at both of those levels, but guess what? The picture may not might look very similar. Okay? So we have two things. We have the structure of a supply demand zone, and then we have the location of a supply demand zone. And this is another big thing that people get wrong. Um, and why that is, we can talk about that at another session. So in the middle here, it's not that we have a lack of supply or demand. Look, supply and demand is everywhere. Every single transaction is because a willing buyer and a willing seller have agreed that that price makes sense for them. Okay, So supply and demand is everywhere. What we care about is identifying an area, the picture, that represents a significant supply-demand imbalance, enough of an imbalance to cause prices to turn in some of the biggest markets in the world. Make sense? Okay. It's not just about demand. It's not just about supply. It's about both together. And that's key. We can identify areas in this uh, novice space in the middle. We can identify pictures of supply and demand, but we're not interested in taking them because the imbalances aren't big. In fact, during this period, um, and I think there's members in our session here today. If you got, if you folks remember, we really didn't do much in the NASDAQ in here. I don't think we did anything. There may have been a little, little day trade here and there, but we really didn't do a whole lot in the NASDAQ. There was more to do in other markets. We were waiting for prices to come down here on the swing trading side of things, right? We, we're not interested in entering positions in the novice space because there's not a 
there's there's a lack of a major supply demand imbalance. So how do we know that? Look at the chart. All of the trading activity in here, all of the wide and whippy trading activity in here, okay, suggests that there's a lack of a supply demand imbalance. If there was a big imbalance in here, would the picture look like this? Would you get all this trading activity? Of course not. The presence of lots of trading activity equates to uh, the lack of a, uh, a, a big supply demand imbalance, okay? Where you, areas on the price chart where you have very, um, um, very low volume equate to very high potential volume on one side of the market or the other, okay? You need to consider that. And it sounds like I'm maybe going through this big list of things you need to figure out. It's all the same thing. I'm just explaining it in different ways. Okay. So um, we identified all this novice space up here, which which it doesn't which gives us quite a bit of information. It tells us that we have a significant profit zone if price comes down to this demand zone, okay, and moves higher. It tells us that price should not have a hard time moving through this space because all of this trading activity is filling the orders that would prevent price from moving up through this space. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, this, these the two demand zones on top of each other here, you see how this is a square or a box and these two are circles? We have a little guide we use in our sessions. Now, we can't bring it up here, uh, but just to give you a little kind of taste of what that guide is, the circles mean that these were overnight demand zones, which are a little bit lower probability, well, sometimes uh, much lower probability than a, a level created during uh, the, you know, the, uh, the regular session hours, okay? But the fact that we had two on top of each other, all right, so, so structure-wise, Help me out here. What would, as far as structure of these two demand zones, um, would we say that's, you know, great structure, good structure, or poor? What would you, what would you say about the structure of these uh, two overnight demand zones on top of each other? Great structure, uh, good structure, or poor? And I'll explain, you know, why that's important. So take a look at where these two demand zones are, all right? So here's the thing. So now we're talking structure. Yeah, I would say poor to, you know, certainly good or poor, right? They're, they're overnight levels. You don't have this explosive move in price out of the level. Prices gradually moves out of the level. Okay. I think we'd all agree they're maybe good to poor. Right. So structure-wise, good to poor, if we're even going to consider good to poor on the structure side, we better have location in our favor. Just like if we don't have location in our favor, the structure better be fantastic. Does that make sense? Again, it's another little thing that people don't think about enough. So we were okay with the fact that this was not great structure because we certainly had location in our favor. All right. And of course, these levels were sitting just below this pit low. And most traders out there, uh, one, once price goes below a pivot low like this, they like to sell, right? How many strategies do we see out there on the internet that say, buy a breakout above this high, short us a, a, a breakdown below this low, right? It's all over the place. That's what most people do. That's exactly what we want, right? We want people selling to us at demand. We want people buying from us at supply. I remember on the trading floor, I used to uh, look, look at my buddy who ran the trade desk and I'd say, you know, like, because I'd see like the, the, the big institution orders are like, are right most of the time. I'd be like, wow, price rallied all the way up to this price level. We have like thousands to sell up here. Who in the world is buying up here? This is like too easy for the institution. He's like, that's how it works. Anyway, here you're seeing it on price chart. Structure, location. So uh, I think uh, just, uh, just a, a little bit later, 
um, you can see on the right, price eventually, price did actually rally all the way back up to here, right? You can see over on the right, price rallied up to here and then just collapsed right into our demand zones. And then, um, and then rallied about 600 points um, and didn't have a hard time doing that. Why was price able to rally a little uh, 600 points or so? Because there was nothing to stop it, right? All of this trading activity here, which is in this novice space, opens up this area. There's no significant supply demand imbalance on the sell side to stop this from happening. Make sense? Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, now I understand, um, you know, how many people, be honest, would be a little nervous maybe pushing the buy button down here or putting on a set and forget trade down here? Anybody maybe be a little nervous or uncomfortable doing that? I mean, you're, you're buying, you'd be buying the NASDAQ when it's like collapsing in price, right? Which is almost always accompanied by some bad news. Uh, that's just how it. That's just how it works and how it happens, right? Even if you have your protective sell stop at low level to manage the risk, you know, typically a lot of people are uncomfortable pushing the buy button when prices are collapsing, right? Yeah. No. Oh, so a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people would be uncomfortable. And and thanks for being honest. Um, so let me explain something. Again, if we go back to the one of the original questions, why do banks and financial institutions make so much money and most other people don't, right? Why do, what, I don't know, I think we all kind of agree that around probably 90% of people, you know, traders lose money and it's that other 5 to 10% that do very well. Why is that? It all begins and ends in our head, in your head. Okay? It's how people think the markets. Yes, the average person, and I would not call anyone in our group here today average, average, uh, I mean, everyone in our group here today has some kind of understanding of trading and investing. Most people around the world don't. But if you think about, um, you know, people that are would be nervous pushing the buy button here, okay, um, what they don't understand is, is what we talked about earlier, that how you make money buying and selling anything is how you make money buying and selling here. If I told you that this was not the NASDAQ, okay, if I told you this wasn't the NASDAQ and I said, you know what, this is your, uh, your favorite brand new Mercedes that typically costs $90,000, uh, but today it's on sale for uh, $10,000 and there's only two left, what are you going to do? Are you going to be are you going to be scared to uh, to buy them? No, you're you're going to probably be so excited and drop everything you're doing and 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 try to grab those two, right? Okay, this this is no different. You have to, it, you have to have that same mentality. All right. At the end of the day, another way to say this to keep it simple: the opportunity here was to buy at wholesale prices in a market with people who are from people to buy at, a, at, at buy at wholesale prices from people who are trained and conditioned to sell at wholesale prices. Yeah. So I love that question, Boz. What's the catch? There absolutely is a catch. Like anything in life, if something seems too good to be true, it usually is. This is absolutely one of these things. Because if this sounds easy and looks easy, Okay, I would argue that um, the rules around doing this are, are very simple. The rules are very simple. And for people that, that know me and our group here and people that are in our group, um, you know, would you agree that the rules are fairly simple? But here's the catch. Doing it is not easy. It's not easy for the average person. Right? We're suggesting that this is a buying opportunity here when the when the most bullish, you know, one of the biggest markets in the world is collapsing. It's not comfortable for people. Anyway, um, there you go. I want to I want to go over one more thing though. Here, let's go back to our uh, our. Let, let's actually go back here. Let's go back to our stick figures, our, our basic supply demand concept here. Okay. 
how much out of a out of a hundred percent of time, how much time would you say price spends in the middle in a market in this novice space? versus out at supply and out at demand what percentage of time of of a of a of a, of a market's open a uh, time that it's open how much what percentage of that time is price spent somewhere in the middle and at supply and at demand what would you say to that exactly vahesh to most people it does look like a falling knife but i mean yeah most of the time right most of the time okay I would say it spends at least 90% of the time somewhere in the middle, and it's probably more than that. Okay. What percentage of traders out there lose money? And you don't have to answer that question. I know we already did, but do you see the link? We're human beings. We always want to be doing something. Is that the right thing to do here? Now, on the day trading side, certainly you can have more activity. You don't just have to sit around and wait for a swing trade like this. We have plenty of day trading opportunities in our program, but you're still, you, we still want to stay out of the middle and only uh, sell at supply and buy at demand. Does that make sense? There's a reason why most people don't well and don't do well and very few do. Okay. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. But again, you, you can see the correlations with these all these percentages, time, and people. All right, let's keep going. So now let's look at an opportunity that uh, we found this week that did not work out. If you look over here on the right, this was the euro. Uh, notice it's a gray box. It's not a yellow box, maybe like you're used to seeing. The reason why it's a gray box is because when we find an opportunity and, and put it out there in our sessions, um, the gray box means that the, op, that the demand zone or supply zone is somewhere in the middle. That's what the gray box means. If it was outside the middle, it would be a yellow box. Okay. Now, again, we have a whole guide for this, and it's a probability guide. Right. So um, uh, some people in the, in the program that take some of these levels in the middle, many of them work, but they'll reduce their position size because these are lower probability opportunities. Okay. All right. Um, Norman, there actually was a uh, uh, you can't see it on the chart here because this is a picture, but just above this area and to the left, uh, there, there actually is another uh, level up there. So it might be the one you're talking about. I'd have to look around that 11,000, but I know it's, it's, uh, I know it's somewhere up there around that, but let's take a look. So here's this demand zone. Now it did work out a little bit. You can see uh, price did just come back and touch the level. I don't know, maybe it went up three to one. Uh, you'd really have to have your entry right there just before the level to get that. But you know, price did bounce there, but ultimately it, it didn't produce what, what you would probably want it to produce and went through the level. Why is this? such a lower probability opportunity than this one look at its location i would argue that structure wise this demand zone probably looks better than the one in the nasdaq right this is the euro the one we've been looking at is in the, is in the nasdaq but I, again look at the structure of this one it looks better than uh this one in the nasdaq or these two in the nasdaq but location is such an important factor. This one was kind of sitting right in the middle of all this. So if there was a, if there was a kind of a real lack of, of any news or influence on price, there'd probably be enough of a supply demand imbalance in here to cause price to turn and get going. But with any kind of, you know, uh, influence on price that's going to bring in more sellers, this level is not likely to have a big enough Im imbalance on the buy side, right? To uh, and that's because price is here in the middle. Okay. And again, just want to make sure you see the difference. So the Nasdaq level that we just went over was found down here. This Euro one was somewhere in here. And this was a five-minute uh, chart for a little day trade, but just want to make sure that you see the difference. All right. So 
Most of these uh, uh, Friday Trade of the Week sessions that we do are meant to be about 15 minutes to a half hour. Some will go longer, um, but they're, they're meant to hit on a concept all around a trading opportunity uh, that we found at the, uh, at the side and strategies. And, uh, hopefully that was helpful. And again, if, uh, to summarize the theme, it's when it comes to supply and demand, the focus is the imbalance. And what's important is structure and location. Those are always the two things we want to consider. On that note, again, great to be with you. Great to see uh, some of you that we haven't seen for a while. And uh, have a fantastic weekend. All right, we'll see you next time.